My name is Dan Meyer. I teach high school math in Santa Cruz, California. I teach high school math to, to remedial populations, kids who don't like math. And uh, I'm obsessed with what to do with those students. So I'd like to preface here real fast with a graph that every new teacher in California has seen. It's an offensive graph. We saw this and we thought, how dare you stereotype us uh, with one graph for all of us teachers. And then we saw it a little closer and we thought, uh, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a second graph I've drawn for myself, uh, you know, my own assessment. And uh, yeah, as, as I got into my teaching career, I felt myself getting better at teaching math computation, like adding fractions, factoring quadratics, and, and still I was making my students stupider, and I couldn't figure out why that was. And what I realized is that um, I don't do math reasoning well, and math reasoning is the stuff that my students need, uh, students who won't go on to STEM majors. So my parents need, what everyone who's outside of this group of freaks in here could use, <laughs> math reasoning. Uh, David Milch, TV showrunner, has a great term for this, impatience with irresolution. His audiences want simple sitcom-sized problems that wrap up in 22 minutes and three commercial breaks and a laugh track. And, and, and the real world's problems aren't like that. No worthy problem is. And uh, my students are impatient with irresolution. They do math reasoning very poorly, and that's due to how I teach and what I teach. Just examining those here. Uh, Clever Haunts. Uh, next is a horse who can compute, compute sums, differences, products, and square roots in uh, in his head. You'd say Hans, two plus three, and Hans would clomp out one, two, three, four, and stop on five. Amazing! No one could figure it out until they did. Hans was not a mathematical genius. Hans was a very keen observer of the human face, and Hans would watch you, watching him, and suck in a little bit of breath, or your eyebrows would go up in anticipation. And Hans would know to stop there, and it's unbelievable how, how no one could stop themselves from doing this. And I have, I've come to realize that I teach and create clever Hanses by how I teach. And if you know what I'm talking about, I know you do. Like, we all do this. I've had, to, I've had to kill a whole bunch of behaviors. Mostly, I've had to suppress my instinct to triumph with a student who got a question right. Like, I want to re rejoice with them, but instead I keep the same dour face and ask the question, okay, why? A um, whole bunch of questions, and in, in some, I've tried to be less helpful. I've realized in my six years I've been helpful in all the wrong ways. That's how I teach. Addressing what I teach is a, a, a big deal also. Here's a, here's a problem. Check this out. We have three pieces of information, all of which figure into the solution in, in some form or fashion. You know, there's not too much info. There's not too little. Uh, there's just enough. How many problems, worthy problems from your life, have you solved like that? I argue very few. So I've had to toss in just a ton of noise into my problems. Just uh, forcing students to grapple with the question, okay, what's necessary? What's relevant here? Um, and that's been, that's been really key for me. Einstein was the one who said that the, the formulation of a problem is just as essential, if not more so, as the solution itself. But we give students problems, good problems, that are fully formed. And then we, we marvel that they're so disengaged and intimidated by these problems. You know, there's, there's, there's four separate elements at play here. There's that visual, there's the, the math structure, the grid, there's the sub-steps, and the, finally that, that big question we're building up to it. But the students have no place in building that. And mine, that, that doesn't work for mine. It makes them impatient with problem solving and poor math reasoners. So what I do with my practice, I take a, a, a big picture, ask a big question that's unanswerable without grab with the question, uh, you know, what do I need to do now? What do I need to know here? And, and somehow, by making it harder for the students in this way, they're also more engaged. Uh, that they're involved in the formulation of the problem. So what I do is I take a good problem from a textbook and I, I make them over. So right here, uh, first thing I'll do is I'll get rid of the sub-steps and all the given info. Students have to ask themselves, what should I do next? What do I need to know here? So is the side length important? Is the height important? Is the color of the valve important? Um, and then I, uh, I go out and I film a video of somebody actually filling up this water tank. How, how long will it take to fill it up? And uh, it, it's, it's slow and it's boring and students are getting, getting kind of uh, antsy about it. And finally everyone at some point in the classroom is wondering how long will it take to fill up the water tank? <laughs> That's when you know you've got them, right? And uh, we, we check the answer not on the back of the teacher's edition but on, at the end of the video there and see our, if our answer is correct. And so that, like, this is a great time to be a math teacher. We all carry curriculum creation devices in our front pockets, you know, they're cheap, ubiquitous. I can put this stuff online on my blog. I get thousands of people downloading it from all over the world, countries I haven't visited, teachers emailing saying, hey, I used this, it was fun. And by the way, here's how I made your stuff better. And that's just, that's just mind-blowing to me. 
so this is just a great time to be a teacher. It's a great time to teach problem solving. Uh, I thank you for letting me share my excitement with you. Woo!